Hello and welcome along to another one of Al's Geek Labs. Today on the Geek Lab, I'm going to ask you a question. When is an XT not an XT? This machine behind me looks an awful lot like the machine I just showed you there, which is a very true XT. But this one behind me is a bit of a wolf in sheep's clothing. Let's find out what that's all about. Stay tuned. I've probably been waiting for this one for about three weeks. It sat in customs for a very long time. So thank you very much, New Zealand Customs. It's also been reopened uh, by customs and this has all gone soggy. So that's, that's not really a good sign. It's just falling apart in my hand, but there we go. One wonders if they opened it in the rain, outside. This one's come from the United Kingdom of Great Britain. You know, people probably pay good money just for this. This is pretty 60s, 70s retro chic these days. I think people go into shops and buy these things. I don't know why. Thank you very much, George Fidget of Burnham, Rochester. So, is that? Now, can you guess what it might be? Something to do with an IBM, perhaps. Funny that, me with an IBM. <laughs> Never would have thought it. It's like half a wardrobe in here. You're gonna to need to have vacuum the floor after all the shenanigans. Any uh, any guesses yet? How cute! It's got an electrical safety appliance check on it. Do not use after June of the year 2000. I mean. That's pretty good, 2000. This machine I think came out around, well, let's leave a look in the back. Uh, about 1986, I think. Something along those lines anyway. Now I think it's um, Control Alt Race. He's got one of these machines and he just, I think he's just recently acquired it. And it's a great machine. So I'll be watching Reese's video Sometimes, sometime really soon when he releases it. So this machine here has seen a little bit of modification by the looks of things. That three and a half inch floppy is certainly, in my opinion, not the original floppy. But this five and a quarter, I think probably is. Looks like it's got a floppy disk in it. Now, I love on the back of these machines, you can always tell it came from the UK because it says made in the UK, Greenock, Scotland. And um, I used to live literally just round the corner from where these machines were produced. What we have here, people, is the IBM PC XT. Looks exactly the same as the XT from the front, but well, obviously the disk drives are different looking, but it looks identical, the case itself. The only difference is, down there it says 286. So, that's kind of odd, because that means it's got a 16-bit bus, but it says XT, and the XT had an 8-bit bus. So all of that got me to thinking, I should really compare all the specifications for the machines. I say machines because we should really compare the XT, the original XT, the XT286, and then also the 80 the models 5160, 5162, and 5170, respectively. So to start off with just the two, the XT and the XT286, the CPUs are pretty different beasts. The CPU speed of the XT was 4.77 MHz, whereas the CPU's clock cycles scored at 6 MHz for the 286. The bus size was fully 8-bit, and as, as I said, it's a 16-bit one for the 5162. Expansion slot-wise, 
Because it was an 8-bit bus, of course it was limited to 8-bit cards on the XT. Whereas on the 5162, it will allow for 5 16-bit cards and 3 8-bit cards. The RAM it came with shipped was 256k on most of the XT boards, however many of them were upgraded later on to 640k. On the 5162 they came shipped with 640k. The maximum the RAM could ever be expanded to was, well, 640k, maybe a megabyte if you did some trickery on the XT, whereas the XT286 could do, well, depending on how you read the materials, 12.6 megabytes or 15.5 megabytes is the maximum theoretical I think that a machine can take. The XT didn't have a battery backup clock, whereas the XT286 had a, had a battery for retaining various pieces of information, including the CMOS information. Wait states are things that cause the processor to hold back the CPU to let the system keep up with the microprocessor. With the 286 XT, that didn't have any wait state, whereas the other machines that used the DIP style memory did indeed have wait states. In January 1987's PC magazine, it stated off the 5162 that one bus cycle, which actually determines processing speed, requires 500 nanoseconds on a 6 MHz AT and 375 nanoseconds on an 8 MHz AT. The XT model 286 roars through its bus cycle in 334 nanoseconds, all down to the removal of wait states. When it came to floppy disk drives, the XT had a 360k full height floppy disk drive, whereas the XT286 had a 1.2 megabyte half height floppy drive. The other specifications are pretty similar, however it is worthy to say that there is only one disk adapter card in the XT286 versus two cards, one for the floppy drive and one for the hard drive. So it basically combines those two cards into one nice card. Later on in this video, I'm going to show you a comparison between the XT, the XT286 and the AT, including running some speed test software. Here we are. So I left the United Kingdom in around 2010 and before I moved out I had to unfortunately sell off my XT286 which is a real shame. I had two, I had the XT and the XT286 and to be honest with you the XT286 was actually probably my favourite of the machine so no idea why I particularly I sold this one. It's a great machine because it has the aesthetic which I love of the XT but the power off better than the lower end AT. It has a 20 meg hard drive, this is um, a BASF one, um, I'm not sure if it is the original but it is a half height uh, MFM style hard drive. The controller card is a 2-in-1 IBM stock controller, it has both the floppy drive controller and the hard drive on one board. Other expansion cards wise, it's pretty spartan, there's a Hercules monochrome style graphics adapter with a combination parallel port and there's also an IBM asynchronous card, a serial card. Over here you can see a close-up of the SIMS, single inline memory modules and as far as I know this was the first IBM computer that had SIMS in it. They were fully removable, just click the sides and pull them out, just like modern day DIMMs. So I've decided to hook it all up and see if it's going to work. I've had a quick inspection, took all the cards out, had a quick inspection, looked at the tantalum capacitors, um, they seem okay, so let's just fire it up. There we go. It's run setup. hard drive just shut down there. I think the hard drive, it shouldn't make that noise. <laughs> but, um, but it looks like the system's actually working uh, and I can get a, an MS-DOS disk and see what happens. The hard drive just went off again. Very weird. Nice little flashing red light as well. One thing um, that you saw on startup was the fact that the setup utility 
hadn't been run or it needed to be run. Now, the setup utility on these IBMs was a bit different to you know the, the clones that came afterwards. You usually press Dell or F1 or something like that, and you get into the CMOS settings. But with this, these came with these big boxy things, and I'm pretty sure the diagnostics disc in here had the what uh, what the setup program was. So you could actually start up from the disc, and I think it's this red one here. So I made a quick look at the diagnostic setup tool and uh, played around with that. I set some settings and so forth, but I also remembered that my CMOS battery uh, was probably well and truly dead. So I went out to the shop and bought a new CMOS battery. But this is uh, an example of the, um, the diagnostics disc that um, IBM called it. It's basically their very primitive version of a CMOS setup tool. But it also importantly sets up the hard drive type. So um, in the old days, the hard drive types 1 through 46, I think it was, allowed you to choose a preset value where your hard drive cylinders, heads and sectors was all defined. So you knew the, the capacity of your drive. That way you could just enter a number. Uh, so all of that, I tried all of this and um, basically long story short is that the hard drive was kaput. Um, and, and, and look, I could spend a long time making a video about how I could repair it and so forth. But realistically, I've got a lot of those hard drives lying around anyway. And I want to use this particular machine as a daily driver. So I thought this is going to have a compact flash card in it anyway as the hard drive. So I won't spend too much time on that. Maybe another day down the line, I'm going to sort that out. But for, for this, I thought, nope, I'm going to get all of the equipment that I want to get and make this machine the ultimate XT286 that I can. So I went off and did just that. So I've been tinkering about here and as you can probably see the first big change on the right hand side is the hard drive uh, type 13 20 megabyte. That's there purely for aesthetic reasons though because I didn't even plug it in. Next you may notice the expansion cards that I put in there. First of all is the tried and true ATI 800 Wonder Plus card. It's a fantastic EGA display card. It's probably one of the best that there ever was so that was my first attempt at making this machine great. Next up is this fairly standard NE2000 style network card. The important thing to note though is that it has an XT-IDE BIOS that I've put on this. So it boots from that so it can then start from a compact flash card. This next beast of a card is called the Intel Aboveboard. Now I've got 1.5 megabytes of RAM on this. Bad boy, it can take a little bit more, but basically this allows me to have EMS or limb memory. So basically I'm thinking about running something like Desk View or maybe even Windows 3.0, and it gives it that extra memory to actually make those applications useful. Next up is the IDE controller. This is a fairly modern style IDE controller, which I run the floppy drives. You might have seen that I have two floppy drives in this now. I put an extra IBM 720K 3.5 inch disc. And also this IDE goes to the compact flash reader on the back, which is a simple IDE device. It's pretty much a pass through. So you can stick your compact flash card in there and it will read away just like any normal IDE hard drive. Just for giggles, I also put in a Soundblaster 16 audio card. One other last minute addition I made was to add the 80287XL, which is a 387 math coprocessor with a 287 pinout. Twice as fast as the 287 during basic arithmetic and has 387 instructions including sin, cos, etc. It runs at 50% higher frequency than the 287. So without further ado, I knew it was time to start testing the system speed. First up was Landmark 6.0 and it came out as a 9 MHz AT even though it had a 6 MHz CPU. The maths floating point unit also came in at 9.4 MHz. Here's Landmark 2.0 which is an older version of the same software and it changed the rating to an 8 MHz with an 11 MHz floating point unit. I do believe that Landmark actually changed the algorithm in their software and that's why the different result came up. Finally was Norton System Information and that came up as correctly an IBM XT286 with a 6 MHz processor. It identified an 80387 rather than a 287 XL but that's probably right because it does work like a 387. So before I speed test in real life the 5170 or AT, 
Let's compare the three, the 5160 XT, the 5162 XT 286, and of course, the 5170 AT. So we can see the differences as discussed already between the XT and the XT 286, but the 5170 and the 5162 are very similar. Same CPU, same CPU speed, at least for the first model anyway, same CPU bus, um, slightly different in terms of the expansion slot types, but that won't make any difference for the performance. The AT actually had less memory than the 5162. The base model had 256K, and your motherboard could support up to 512K. If you needed any more than that, you had to get an expansion card, whereas 5162 came with 640K as standard on the motherboard. Maximum RAM could be expanded to about 15 or 16 megabytes, so roughly the same between the 5162 and the 5170. Both had the battery-backed clock, but only the 5162 had that zero-weight state RAM on SIMS instead of DIP memory. Slightly better power supply in the 5170AT at 192 watts versus the 157 in the 5162. Pretty much the same idea for the floppy disk drives, and the hard drive capacity was 10 megabytes better in the AT. It was also an awful lot faster than the one that was in the XT286. And everything else was pretty much the same, although theoretically the effective speed versus the 6 megahertz AT was a bit faster on the XT286. Depending on what results we looked at in the previous section of the video, you could see that the results were between 8 and 9 megahertz versus 6 dead straight for the AT. So if I was to add it up all on paper and say that the green ones were the best results, the amber ones were the medium results, and the red ones were the worst results, then you can see just by one point, the AT would be the winner. But you can't really quantify the zero weight state RAM in this sort of a test. So what does it look like in the test software? Well, first of all was the system bench from Norton System Information. And you can see that the AT has a rating of 3.1 versus the XT286 with 4.4. So smashing it really. And then in terms of landmark speed test, this is version two, first of all, you can see the clock speed looks a lot faster as well, 7.55 MHz on the XT286 versus 6 on the AT. And then next up with version 6 of the same tool, Landmark, you can see the XT286 outperform the AT again, and this time it reckons it's 9 MHz CPU versus 7 MHz CPU. And now I was convinced that my 5162 was better than the 5170, it was time to add the final part to the puzzle. I already had an EGA display adapter, and now I needed an EGA monitor. As I said at the beginning of this video, I'd been searching a very long time for another 5162. I'd reckon almost 10 years in fact. And I'd also been looking for even longer for an IBM 5154 EGA display. Here in New Zealand, they are pretty much impossible to find. Well, I found one here in New Zealand, and yes, it was broken. So I'm not very good at fixing up CRT monitors, but my friend Jacob, who also owns Monotech PCs, the company responsible for the Nuxt, the external CRT, the Micro RAM, and a really nice XT CF IDE card, amongst other products, helped me out with fixing the very sad 5154. Firstly, Jacob replaced the paper film EMI caps and the small caps in the PSU that usually die. And then to my surprise, the monitor fired right back up. All of the pots needed adjusting and some had already played, but Jacob then got it to sync up to both mode 1, which is CGA, and mode 2, which is EGA high res signals, and fixed the image size and position. The convergence rings were loose as well and a couple of tabs had even broken off and indeed the image wasn't totally converged. Jacob hadn't converged the CRT before and spent a few hours on it getting slightly better, but still not perfect. Another problem existed when the monitor was cold. The image was quite unstable and horizontally wavy. Once it warmed up, this becomes more of a vibration. The camera image here doesn't pick this up, it just shows it as wavy. And then after a while it became perfectly solid. Although unfortunately, Every now and again, the image will wobble for a second, 
and once in a while it would go completely out of focus for a few seconds, then shifting in and out before becoming right again. Jacob then readjusted the pot on the tripler to get it into perfect focus when working normally. He reflowed the flyback joints and replaced caps that were in reach. The rest of the caps required moving the high voltage board, which was a big job, so he didn't do that. You could also see that the paper film cap goo had leaked onto the power supply unit and high voltage board connectors. There was a white crystalline substance on many parts, mainly attracted to the trim pots, most of which brushed off with mild scrubbing. Jacob then replaced the rest of the caps and the wobbly image was fixed. But even after this, the display was still glitchy, especially shortly after power on, with the occasional defocusing for a moment as you can see in this video he took. Jacob thought it might be the tripler, the power supply, or maybe the electronics that drive the flyback transformer. In the end, he decided to scour the net for a replacement tripler. Jacob eventually found a replacement tripler, which was cheap enough to buy, but very expensive to ship from the US. However, it was worth it, as it seems to have fixed both problems. So I owe a huge amount of gratitude to Jacob at Monotech Vintage PCs. Thank you very much, Jacob. So perhaps 15 years in the making, I finally got the PC that I always wanted, the XT286 with a 5154 EGA monitor. I also made sure it was pimped up because it had the EGA display card, a fast coprocessor, a compact flash hard drive, 1.5 megabytes above board, and a network card. So I'm pretty chuffed, I've got to say. But what about you? What's your favorite? The IBM PC AT 5170 or this, the IBM PC XT 286? Let me know in the comments below. I'm really interested to what you all think. If you do like my videos, as usual, please subscribe and hit that notification button to let you know when the next video is coming out. Thank you very much for watching. Stay safe and I'll see you soon.